Okay. Um, so we said that we were going to talk reduced instruction set versus uh, Intel architecture. So we'll, we'll handle this fairly briefly because it's only, you know, it's kind of a risk versus Intel architecture. Okay, so the goal of a CPU is to provide enough magic tricks to solve the general problems required for the underlying computer. That's the goal of a CPU. Okay, Give us enough magic tricks to solve all the problems we should be able to solve in that computer. A couple approaches to this. One approach is give us a bunch of magic tricks, um, you know, kind of like a, if you have a toolbox at home, you might have more than one tool that can solve the same problem, but you can decide which tool to grab at a particular point in, particular point in time. Um, so you'd rather have everything you need and then some versus not quite having everything you need and then having to MacGyver some solutions. All right, so IA, we'll just say Intel architecture is the expanded approach, you know, gives us as many tools as they can and we may have multiple ways of accomplishing things which also then gives us some options, which also then takes us back to the discussion we had at the beginning of class talking about, you know, are, are all um, assembly language programs created equal? You know, is, is the, what's coming out of the high-end compiler um, better than what we can produce? Well, quite possibly. Uh, things that modern compilers do is like um, something called unrolling the loop. We'll talk about that at some point, where if there's a loop that goes through 10 times, it might duplicate the body of the loop and have it go through five times for performance increases, that, that type of stuff. So there's uh, that goes into something called pipelining. You'll read about that in the first chapter of the, uh, the book. So Intel architecture says we're going to give you as many magic tricks as we possibly can that we can fit on the chip without it burning up, blah, 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 to accomplish things. Now a reduced instruction set gives us a minimal number of tools that hopefully allows us to solve all problems with some creativity. All right, so it's kind of like uh, you go on to uh, Amazon and buy one of those starter little household tool sets that come with just a couple screwdrivers and a hammer and that kind of stuff. And then you, uh, uh, you know, you're going to go out and do a Habitat for Humanity thing. And uh, that's a Christian worldview. Um, Habitat for Humanity thing where you uh, uh, are building a house using your, you know, thing that's supposed to be like for changing like light bulbs <laughs> and stuff like that. Could you do it? Yeah, I mean, you know, with, with some creativity and some MacGyvering and, um, you know, looking for sticks and stuff like that, you could, you, you could probably, you know, eke by if you had to, right? Oh, that's a good, good question. Um, so, <laughs> meet Abraham. Christian worldview. Um so, you know, in any case, that's kind of the, the mindset of a um, reduced instruction set. Now, on one hand, that seems to be inconvenient, right? Like, well, why would we, why would we do that um, when it might be harder to solve problems? What do you suspect is the motivation behind reduced instruction set? Okay, so let's go down that line. Kind of maybe not really the question I meant to ask, but probably the question I did ask, or at least interpretable, is that. 
So the idea would be, and this is evidenced by what we see today, a lot of these mobile devices are moving to ARM chips, which are a reduced instruction set, um, where they, you can kind of have both and, right? You can take advantage of a reduced instruction set architecture um, because you can more capably capture the problems you're going to need to solve on that chip for devices that don't need to do as many things. You know, if we are trying to build a toolbox that can solve any generalistic computer problem, but try to keep that toolbox as, as lightweight as possible, uh, those two concepts are at odds with each other, right? Like, you kind of need more tools. Well, I don't want to carry more tools. The problem's going to be harder to solve. Well, I want it to be easy. Like, <laughs> those, those, those guys are, are, are at odds. Um, so if we have domain specific problems to solve, reduced instructions, that certainly makes more sense. But then at that point, is it really, you know, when we say reduced instructions that we're kind of using this gen as a generic term to talk about, uh, you know, the concept of saying, here is my target problem I'm solving. And here is the minimal number of magic tricks I need to solve it versus here is the ideal number of magic tricks that I would need to to solve all those classifications of problems. The reduced instruction set approach would be the minimalistic approach. The idea for some domain specific applications like mobile applications and that kind of stuff uh, would say that the minimalistic approach might be m less minimalistic than it would sound on paper. It might be closer to everything that I might need. So uh, having said that, what is the motivation of saying, we want to give you a lighter backpack? Okay, so we think about this in, in uh, real life terms. So we're, we're, we're going out to the wild and we need to survive for a month. Okay, so, okay, so we, wait, as long as I can find water, I could survive for a month just off my body fat. Okay, I like my chances, people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so what is it? I think it's, isn't it 3,500 calories is in one pound of fat? I think that's the, this is related to computer organization. Um, so let's see, how many pounds overweight am I? Maybe like 15, 20 pounds? Uh, <laughs> per square inch? <laughs> So, so let's. What are we comparing this is for a human or whale? Yeah, or I think my doctor says that I should weigh two hundred and ten pounds. That seems to be too light for me. Yeah, that's what he says. Six, six four. Yeah, I have a pretty big frame. I don't think I'd look right at, at two ten. So let's say it. Let's let's say it's it's let's say it's two thirty. Let's say it's two thirty. Okay, so that puts me at about 120 pounds overweight. All right, so so we have 120 times 3,500. So I have 420,000 extra calories. Okay, okay. So you want to say you're, you know, that I mean, 2,000 is like an appropriate meal per day, right? All right, so divided by 2,000. So I have 210 <laughs> days. Okay, I could almost go a year. Okay, I and mean, especially if you cut back. I mean, two thousand calories—that's living it up, yeah. right? I mean, what's the minimum number of calories a human can live off? Like probably five hundred. Well, depends on much energy you're using. So are you if running you're around trying to find water? water every day? Huh? What's up? If you're just sitting there drinking water, then you're probably gonna die. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I'm good for like multiple years. <laughs> Eight hundred and forty days. It's like the the best diet around. He was gonna put me next to a stream <laughs> with Wi Fi. <laughs> you know, I'm actually. Sally's down by the. Down by the river. What did you eat? Didn't eat again today. <laughs> Same thing. It's a lot of water. It's all squirrels. It's all squirrels. <laughs> Thought about eating it. <laughs> Decided it would be a bad idea to get up. <laughs> Mr. Gonzalez just convinced me otherwise. <laughs>
<laughs> Funny thing is, in a weird way, this is related to the conversation we're about to have. Cool. So, um, okay, so in any case, the uh, um, the reduced instruction set concept is... So we were talking about going into the lab with a backpack. We need to we need to survive. Okay, and we're going to say we're already of ideal body weight. All right. So um, got to survive for a month. Which is the better approach to give a person a lightweight backpack with a minimalistic set of tools to hopefully you know solve any problem they might run into, or a heavier backpack with every tool they might need? What are the pros and cons of each? What's what what's ideal about uh, a lightweight backpack? Burning less of those calories that you're going to live off of. Well, so easier to move around, right? You know, less less crap to drag around. So you're you're nimble. Okay? I mean, I'm nimble anyways. So I mean, you know, what's an extra forty pounds? I don't know. <laughs> it's barely noticeable. I mean, I can still move around pretty good on the uh, uh, sand volleyball court, so should be fine, right? Yep, nailed it. Um, so the other approach is, hey, I have every tool I might need. I'm going to be able to move a little slower because I'm, you know, I, I, I'm burdened with uh, extra stuff. But whenever I run across a run across a problem, I should more easily be able to solve that problem. Fair enough. Clearly, both of these have their pros and cons, right? Now, the con associated with the lighter backpack is we might run into problems that are not as conveniently solvable because I don't have all the tools that I would ideally have, okay? But the pro is that I could go longer uh, without accomplishing as much, let's say, because I'm carrying less weight. Make sense? All right, so I'm using less energy. That's where we're kind of coming back to this idea with energy. Uh, where the other guy is like, hey, look, I, I mean, I'm using plenty of energy because I'm carrying around all the tools, but every single time I run into a problem, I should be able to solve it, you know, hopefully conveniently. All right, so the concept of a reduced instruction set is let's try to make this a lower power consuming chip uh, and give you enough that enough to, to, to solve problems, but not too much that the chip has to drain more power, which translates into more battery life loss and all this other stuff. Now, keep in mind, when we're talking about the Apple PowerPC uh, war versus Intel, um, really it was IBM versus Intel and that, but Apple adopting the PowerPC chip, uh, battery life wasn't really a thing. Um, you know, all laptops had bad battery life back then. You know, it, they, they weren't talking about 10 hours of battery life. They were talking about, you know, if you unplugged it, it won't die for 30 minutes. Good luck. Okay. <laughs> so, so shut the lid and then you maybe have 45 minutes. Again, good luck. Um, so it was a, you know, a, a different problem. So we weren't really thinking about mobile computing back then. Yeah, they were heavy. All right, so... Um, since we weren't really thinking about uh, battery life, what was hopefully going to be the gain of a reduced instruction set? Less energy probably means less what? Okay. By heat. Kind of heat's our enemy, right? So anytime we get into hardware, heat, heat is bad. So the idea is that with a reduced instruction set, the processor should run cooler, which translated into, um, you know, if uh, I had a, um, a Macintosh uh, G4, which was a PowerPC chip, uh, and inside of it just had heat sinks, no fans. You know, a heat sink was, a, was enough to dissipate the heat to a, a reasonable level. Uh, you know, I don't think I ever actually took a drink of that. Nailed it. All right. So a single heat sink was enough to dissipate the heat. Where if you look inside of a, uh, you know, a Core i7 machine today, especially if you're, you know, getting one of the higher higher clock speed ones, quad core, blah blah blah, 
uh, you're not getting away with a heat sink. You're getting away with a pretty tall fan with a lot of airflow <laughs> to, to dissipate heat away from that thing, right? Now, nobody's saying that a Core i7 chip is, is cool running, all right? Um, so reduced instructions that would say, hey, less heat is better. Fine. Because we didn't, we had less parts in our computer to break down. When you have a fan inside the computer, that's a moving part. That's something that can fail, correct? Uh, uh, lower power chips. No, they're Intel chips. Yeah, they're Intel chips, but they are their mobile version of the Intel chips. I, I think they're the what the point uh, uh, one one micron uh, mobile chips, and they run at a. I mean, they do have. I think the entire laptop, the entire bottom, is a heatsink. So I think yeah. they've done some cool technology stuff for dissipating heat to, to take the fans out. But they also have variable speed processors in there that are, you know, that thing will get hot if you try to make it hot. <laughs> so, you know, you don't want to sit there and play uh, Battlefield with that on your lap. Um Chances are it'll dissipate the, the heat enough to not damage the laptop right into your, right into your third degree burns in your legs. <laughs> you got the Microsoft logo branded on you. This is, I mean, I could just feel the heat. Just, Smokes <laughs> out, of, out of the screen almost. Man, even the smells. <laughs> is that burning flesh? <laughs> All right. <laughs> just amazing. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna stand up for a second. I'm gonna sit this wrong. Um, Don't take it until you see me do this thing. Really? I used to do it all the time. You wasn't in church and you just did it. Well, before we, well, I, I've been teaching for a few minutes. So uh, <laughs> uh, when I first started teaching, we didn't have projectors. This is my 18th year teaching. So I used to write all the software on a chalkboard. Oh. <laughs> Imagine those days. That was also when I used to teach in shorts and t-shirt with a different uh, dress that was at Western Illinois University. There's not much difference. Now you have a fake tie. And, and that's a real tie. No, that's a, yeah, yeah, that's well. a really tie. So it's not a clip-on. It's legit. It's on a golf polo, but I can pull that off. I'm not wearing a button down the front <laughs> dress shirt, you know, because I'll pop buttons. Well, Dr. Rockler is wearing t-shirts over his, uh, yeah. his yeah. So I guess The difference is he can't pull that off. <laughs> he also is the head under the butt. And he can't pull that off. <laughs> All right. So, in any case, one of the goals would have been reduced heat, right? Uh, reduced moving parts. You know, less things to fail, blah, blah, blah. Um, an issue they had, and this is kind of related to uh, um, a paper I had, uh, the undergrad version of this course do, talking about uh, AMD 64, 64-bit processors, uh, compared to uh, kind of how AMD was ahead of the game for coming out with 32-bit, 64-bit uh, processors to their own demise. Their innovation ended up showing Intel that it's too soon. The software industry isn't where it needs to be for 64-bit processors to make sense. So who failed because of it? AMD did. AMD went from a, you know, a legitimate threat to Intel. I mean, these were head-to-head -head competitors to nobody's claiming that AMD is the superior, uh, um, you know, desktop processor today. AMD's real mark today is in GPUs. Well, that's because Intel just destroyed the company. Well, because of that door that was open. AMD made an AMD 64 processor, which was a 64-bit architecture, target at consumers before any 64-bit software was available. So any, so the only people who could even take advantage of it were folks running Linux with a 64-bit kernel that they compiled themselves. So that was a very, very tiny percentage of your consumer population, right? Most people ended up hurting their performance because they're... 64-bit AMD chip was running in 32-bit mode to be backwards compatible, which actually ran slower than if you had the equivalent clock speed 32-bit processor. So it was just ahead of its time. So AMD had 
good technology that if it had come out, I mean, it, it ended up being about 10 years too early. 64-bit didn't really even become a standard thing until not that long ago. Maybe four years ago, something like that. I mean, heck, Flash still isn't written in 64 bits. Flash was also <laughs> no, yeah. You had to wait for it to die before they converted to 64 bits. Nintendo 64 came out in 96. But that was a, so that's right back to what we were talking about. That's a domain specific thing. They write, wrote software or their makers wrote software for that specific hardware. Didn't matter. Software was available. So it wasn't that 64 bit didn't exist. I mean, you know, it's just like we looked at the instructions a few minutes ago. It's here's, here's your address space. How many bits are you going to use for your instructions? How many bits are you going to use for your parameters? Blah, blah, blah. It was the problem of saying 64 bits for the general purpose computer when general purpose computers are reliant on software that was not 64 bits. So everything was being run in the old way of doing it. Not dissimilar to when uh, uh, Apple transitioned from uh, the Mac OS to OS X, which was a Unix based operating system, which is actually very related to what we're talking about. None of the software that ran on your Mac last week would run on your Mac today when you upgraded to OS X because OS X was Unix, not Mac OS. It would be like expecting Linux software to run on Windows, even though the underlying hardware is the same. The operating system is completely different. Okay, it's actually very related to what we're talking about. So Apple had to go through growing pains. When they, when they sent the uh, uh, OS X out, when it first came out, it shipped with a emulator called the Blue Box. And that emulator ran Mac OS 9 in software horrifically slow so that you could run your Mac software that you already owned that was made for the Mac OS as opposed to, well, the traditional Mac OS instead of the new Unix-based Mac OS. Uh, so this must have been, what, 10 years ago? Something like that. Whenever the first OS X came out. They roughly came up with one every year, so you figure they're on version 10 right now. So probably roughly 06, 05, 04. When was the original OS X out? 01. 01? Okay. Um, but whatever. So, I mean, that was a, a growing pain. I mean, Apple had to go through that transition, but it, it was one of the things that saved Apple. I mean, had Apple not changed to an operating system that was based on, you know, that was significantly more stable... I mean, Apple's OS today wouldn't be considered as good as it is. Um, personally, I think Apple gets too much credit for their OS. I mean, I think that uh, um, certainly Mac's OS is, is stable, but it's not because of anything Apple really did. It's because it's based on Unix. It's, it's, it's based on Unix, and people aren't writing viruses for it because they don't, you know, why target the five people who are running Macs? Um, but... Uh, you know, I had a, a friend of mine who is not necessarily computer savvy. I mean, we we many of us in here have Macs sitting in front of us. Um, you know, we've all heard the old Macs are user friendly and all that stuff, right? You've heard all that crap. My friend said, "Hey, on a Windows machine, I I know where to start. I hit the start button. That's where you start. That's where the stuff is. Where do you start on a Mac? If it's not on your little launch bar there at the bottom or on the side." You don't know where to go. I mean, I, I personally think once you get used to the Mac and kind of get all the keyboard shortcuts and stuff like that, you can move around a Mac pretty quickly. Um, I think it's better than the Windows interface for, you know, for, for flip flying around through the OS once you're used to the, the stuff. I would say for your average user, I don't think it's more user friendly at all. I mean, I think iOS is. I think iOS is substantially more user friendly than Android. Um, you know, if you if you were going to put something in front of Grandpa, I think he's going to have a fighting chance with an iOS device over an Android device. But I'd pick. I, I like Grandpa's chances on Windows 10 ahead of Mac OS. You know, if he's trying to open up a web browser, <laughs> especially since he might accidentally open up Safari on the Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Safari on the Mac is a far better thing to open up than Internet Explorer on a PC. So we're just being realistic. Internet Explorer. Uh, 
<laughs> so, oh, oh, their browser's called Edge. They rebranded it, but it's the same. No. Uh, oh, he's about to defend Microsoft. Everybody relax. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because it actually deserves legitimate defense. Okay. Edge is not Internet Explorer. Yeah, nothing can cord your system works on Edge. <laughs> that it's not well, fault. yeah, Edge is not just an internet browser; it's their whole system, file system explorer, right? That's their new, yeah, that's their new file system explorer that happens to also be internet aware. No, Edge is their internet browser. Edge, now, I understand. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's their face of the internet browser, yeah. but it's also that it's the underlying technology for the whole for the the whole OS for all the. I mean, you're using the same interface whether you're browsing your local file system or you're doing a Google search, which, which is fine. Nothing, nothing wrong with it. I mean, hey, for, uh, for well, fine, but, Except for Chrome, you, all you, want. you know, punchline is if you sit down, uh, I mean, why was Internet Explorer as bad of a browser as Internet Explorer was? Why was Internet Explorer the top browser in the world for so long? Where does the Internet live? According to Grandpa, it's behind the blue E. There's nothing wrong with that. Put the blue E right at the desktop. That's where the internet lives. Double click on the blue E. You download Chrome. You rename it to internet. You change the icons. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair enough. So when, you know, so as young people started doing things for their parents or for their grandparents, that's when it started losing market share. But if you were having, you know, Best Buy employees explain to, a, you know, an elderly person. Well, I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm not even knocking on Best Buy employees. I mean, if you are a... You know, a person who's not tech savvy, you want it to be easy, not necessarily the best. You want it to be easy. Um, so, hey, tell me how do I check my email? They give them a nice little Internet Explorer shortcut on their desktop that takes them to Hotmail, and that's how they check their email. And they download their pictures of their grandkids and stuff like that. I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. As technologists, we can say, well, there's a better solution. Well, not for Grandpa. If Google was a guy, I think I maybe have. I don't recall it right now, but like you'd be sitting behind a desk or whatever, and everyone walks up with their searches or whatever. So you'd be like the old guy, Google.com. That's here. I'm here. I got you. Google.com website. <laughs> uh, there was a video I put up on uh, uh, Facebook this weekend. Um, the was it Northern Toilet Paper? Did you, did you see that post I put up there? It's like a Northern Toilet Paper is doing a throwback to oh, their... Yeah, that's Yeah, let's watch that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me pause this video.